I know we've been talking a lot about you know difficult employees and all this, but it's an important piece, and so that's why we've been spending a few weeks on it. Um, so we're going to talk more about employees with problems, personnel retention, and those types of things today. So we're going to have some employees that are just marginal. Everybody know what that means? It's kind of nothing spectacular, um, not terrible. And so for these types of people, you don't necessarily just want to let them continue to kind of just do the status quo. You want to think about some things, and especially if you know that you're, they're capable of achieving more than they are. So you want to ask, are they bored with their job? Maybe they don't have any friends at work. A lot of times, social interaction will affect job performance, whether that be good or bad. Um, think about if they may have a better fit in a different department than where they are right now. Um, and are the person's egos being met? Meaning, are they confident about the work that they're doing? Is it fulfilling something internal that they have? Is it giving them a reason to want to come to work every day? Now for older employees, you'll have to ask or think about different types of things. You want to make sure that they feel important. Um, so how can you do that? By asking questions, asking their advice. What do you think about this? Um, use them as mentors. So if you have uh, newer people come into the organization or younger people, maybe you want to pair them up with one of your older employees and uh, have them serve as a mentor or somebody that can train them. You always want to explain the need for change. And while you're doing this, make sure you get them involved. And, you know, encourage them to attend meetings and training and things that can constantly challenge them to keep them engaged in their job. They may be winding down towards retirement, right? You may get some employees that are starting to, to look into retirement but don't want to quit altogether immediately and they just want to cut back on their hours. It may be okay to allow them to have some leave without pay or to you know, change their hours rather than just making them leave altogether. What about parents with kids? Have you managed parents with kids and been in situations where you know, they had to go pick up the kid or bring their kid to work? Or It's important that you treat everybody fairly, but at the same time, you don't want to provide inconsistent treatment or um, give priority or preference to, to those with children, meaning, you know, you can't necessarily let Jane Doe leave 30 minutes early every day to go pick up her child when everyone else has to work through their entire shift. Because then you're, you know, you're providing preference to one employee, right? It's just like when, well, this is different, but when people take those breaks for when smoking, break, right? I don't like that. Yeah. They take more breaks than the people who doesn't smoke. Right. Why do they do that? Yeah, I, I, I actually agree with you on that one. It seems somewhat That's unfair that people do get, you know, what, what if I don't smoke? Do yeah. I still get 15 minute break every hour, you know? And that's definitely not going to happen. So, you know, there are some inequities, unfortunately, and that is one of them. And I, I definitely agree with you on that one. Um, unfortunately, they haven't made any moves to try to bring any equality there, unless they decide that they're not going to have any smoking at their facility. Then they can't have smoke breaks, right? The absent employee. We have those employees that are out every other week, right? Whatever the case may be. <coughs> they may be bored, they may be unhappy, we don't know. These are some of the things we can do. You definitely want to make sure that they know that sick leave is not something that they're entitled to. It's usually a benefit that the company will provide. You want to see if there's any dissatisfaction that they have. Maybe they're unhappy about something at work and that's why they're not there. Obviously, you have to set an example. You can't complain about your employees never being at work and you're never there either, right? So you obviously have to set an example. You wanna make sure you document every time they're not there because if, if it does become an issue, you wanna make sure that you build a case 
against them as far as them not being at work if it comes to termination. So what are some common signs of employees with problems, right? Not being at work, increased absenteeism, frequent absences from workstations, always taking breaks, never at their desk, you know, in the cafeteria, outside smoking, on the department, you know, next door, up two floors, never at their desk, never doing work, confusion or difficulty concentrating, or a decrease in their productivity. Their work product has gone from being above average to average or below average. That could be a sign of some problems. What about friction with other employees? Disagreements, fights, arguments. <coughs> Unusual behavior. What if you have this employee that's typically calm and all of a sudden they become very defensive or very grumpy or very quiet? What if you had a talkative employee that all of a sudden has been pretty quiet for past few weeks, could be something wrong. So what do we do once we suspect the problem? Probably want to counsel, right? We talked yeah. about counseling a few weeks ago. This is an opportune time to do the counseling when you suspect that there's an issue. You want to make sure that when you have the counseling session that again they know what's expected of them. Let them know that you've observed something is wrong or something's different. They're not their normal behavior. You want to describe to them what that unacceptable behavior is, talk to them about why it's wrong, how it affects them, the department, the organization. What you don't want to do is ever accuse, right? Especially if you don't have any hard facts. So you don't want to go into the counseling session accusing them of having any behavioral problems or personal problems. But, you know, the counseling session should be somewhat of a meeting that lets them know that you realize that something is wrong and how, how you talk about how you're going to fix it. So there's some questions you, you can ask the employee. Are you aware that your performance is falling below the standard of the job? Is it possible that a personal problem may be at the root of this? Are you aware of our employee assistance program? Do you guys know what an employee assistance program is? Um, they're helpful for situations like this when employees may encounter personal problems or issues that may be affecting their job performance. And last question, which is very important, what can I do to help? Now after you do this, you have your counseling, again, you want to make sure that you're following up because if their performance continues to get worse, we may have to take another, a further step. Now. The other reason you want to follow up is if the employee still doesn't think that they, there's anything wrong. Of course, some may deny, you know, nothing's wrong with me, you know, whatever, I'm just having a bad day or whatever it is. And then when you follow up, you want to make sure that they know if this behavior continues, we may have to terminate you. Now, if they cooperate, you definitely want to show your support. You want to let them know that you, you know, support them, you're proud of them making improvements. Um, you're proud of them cooperating. We have to expect that there may be a relapse, right? How often do people just correct themselves right away and stay on track? Slim, right? So let's not be naive. We have to expect that there's a possibility that there may be a relapse. Now, if they're improving and their work product is getting better, you want to make sure you definitely acknowledge that, whether it be you know, stopping by their desk to fit, uh, verbally tell them good job, send them an email, pick up the phone, give them a call, whatever it is, you want to acknowledge that you see improvement in their work. And resist any temptation to lighten the employee's load. What do you think about that? Are we helping them if there's an issue and we lighten their workload, or are we babysitting them? We're enabling them. Right, we're enabling them. And that we don't want that to happen. So as much as you may want to, as much as you may feel sorry for them or whatever issues they have going on, I have to deal with this all the time, actually. You know? <laughs> I do. And I have to resist the temptation to lighten the workload as much as I may want to. 
I, I can't do it, right? And, and you can't do it either. Not only that, people are watching you. So if employees see you do this for Jane Doe, when, when their situation comes up, when they run out of money, when they get kicked out of their apartment, when they get in a fight with their spouse, they're gonna want you to do the same thing. You don't, then they'll throw it in your face. They're gonna throw it in your face, they may claim discrimination, mm -hmm. favoritism, whatever. So you have to be very careful with this one. Precautions. Use only job performance to initiate corrective procedures. Again, do not attack the person's character, behavior, personality. You want to only focus on job performance when you're trying to correct something. Don't apologize for bringing up that there's an issue. It's not your fault, right? It's not your fault. And what happens when you apologize? What are you showing? Sorry. Are you showing that you're a, a strong and bold showing weakness. manager? Are you showing you might be a pushover? Be a pushover. Right, you're showing weakness. We don't want to discuss personal problems in depth. Why not? Into, you don't want to get too personal. Why not? You want to be able to relate with your employees, right? Yeah, but you don't want to get, uh, there's a fine line. There is a fine line. Yeah. Why don't we want to, why, why don't we want to get into personal problems too much? Because if that's when they think you're, you're friends, it's more friends when than you're a friend. friend. Not only that, you get in too deep. What starts happening? You start getting your feelings, your emotions start getting tied into it. And you, you lose that, that management train of thought. And you might want to come and to And then sometimes again. you get drug into the situation. You get drug into the situation. You don't want to get in between, in the middle of whatever's going on. You don't want to get so emotionally attached to the situation that you're not thinking with your mind. And you start thinking with their emotions. Start really feeling sorry for them. You forget the idea that you're even the manager, that you're in charge, right? So you have to be careful not to get too deep into whatever the issue is. You know, if they start, just pause, you know, pause them and, you know, don't even allow it to get to the point where you're that deep into whatever the issues may be. Do not moralize. Why not? It's not our job to moralize, right? It's our job to manage. So regardless of what the issue is, it's not our job to moralize or demoralize for that matter, either way. And like we said, you gotta be firm. So people problems. It says people problems are not unnecessary intrusions on the supervisor's time. Rather people's problems will always be part of the supervisor's responsibility, right? If there are no people problems, far fewer supervisors would be needed. So part of our job is to handle these people problems. We have to know that they're going to be there, right? So we have this employee. It's not working at the level that they need to be. Do we salvage them or do we cut our losses? Depends on the problem. Depends on the problem, okay. Sometimes it can be more um, costly to keep these type of employees than to just um, discharge them and hire somebody else. The time and energy you spend with trying to salvage an employee, counsel them, provide them with EAP and whatever else they need, you know, after a certain time, it kind of starts to add up and become very consuming, right? So we have to be careful about who we decide to sell. We can't save everybody. Sure, there's some employees that may have been great employees and they're going through some issues. You know, that's totally different from um, other employees, just hold on to it, um, other employees that are just not gonna do our organization any good. I'll talk to you that, about that. What about fighting employees? You let them fight? No. <laughs> no? Do you force them to come to the solution or do you create it? Create it. I create it. 
it depends on what the fight is all about. If it's something, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a very touchy subject because if it's something like if they're working in a team and both of them are not pulling their weight like they need to be, then that's something that needs to be addressed. But you're not gonna let them just duke it out, you know, just back and forth. But it could be a solution that this person is having a problem with this, that, and the other, and they need more help. So it could be a situation to where if you find out this person needs more help and it's just adding to the conflict because this other person is expecting them to do it, then it could be a situation that could be worked out peacefully, I guess. Anybody else? I think you should create it. Why? Because uh, fighting, uh, most of the time, hostility is already there, the animosity is there, and they can't come up with a solution. So the anger just intensifies, and you just need to get them separated, get a, a solution, and get them back to their areas. So what if you just, what if you mediate? You can do that, but that's still coming up with a solution. Not necessarily. You're creating it. You're creating a, a solvable solution. Because you're putting them in a room and you're mediating. Well, I could put them in a room and I could mediate and then tell them to come to the solution. I think if I just tell them to work it out on their own and I'm not bringing them together and there's no third party there, that's probably not going to work. But I might want them to try to figure it out on their own, maybe. And well, I'm just mediation, there. Mediation, maybe. And I'm just there to mediate so they don't you know, kill each other. Maybe with mediation. I, mean, I think either way could work. Um, you know, it kind of goes back to what we talked about, about people taking more accountability if they come up with solutions themselves. Now, some instances, we don't have time. True. So I'm going to step in and say, this is what it's going to be, and this is what it's going to be. And we don't have time to go back and forth for you guys to compromise and collaborate and try to come to an agreement. So I think it depends. I think in both instances, either one could work. That's true. What about unethical behavior? Happens, right? Mm -hmm. Instructing people to do whatever is necessary to achieve results. This happens all the time, unfortunately. Sometimes it's unethical. Taking credit for other people's ideas or shifting blames to other. Playing favorites among staff. Lying or falsifying records. Billing for work not performed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Happens. Oh, yeah. I told you, my ex, the, manager, the owner of the company I used to work with, he's in federal prison right now for doing that. Falsifying records. Falsifying records and keeping social security checks for deceased patients. Oh. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> he really did. Yeah, and the bad part was he didn't want to tell the, he had a lot of facilities, he didn't want to let the facilities know that that's what was going on. So we got state coming in all the time. We got DSS coming in all the time, checking paperwork, checking paperwork. We're not knowing why until after the fact. We see it on the news and it's like, <laughs> okay, when were you gonna say something? Maybe. Well, was gonna say it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, am I gonna get my paycheck? <laughs> Anybody else? Valid question. It's important to note that in most situations, employees, are more likely to do unethical things or make unethical decisions when what? Management makes it difficult for them to avoid doing so, right? So I'm not trying to say that this all falls on us as managers, but we do take, have to take some responsibility for this when it occurs. How do we uh, combat this? We have to have strong ethnic programs, right? It should include having a, a code of conduct which some organizations will post on the walls throughout their facilities. Um, they'll also have it in their policy and procedures manual. Um, but wherever it may be, you should have some type of code of ethics. Additionally, we obviously have to lead by example. We just talked about this. So you can't be an unethical manager trying to lead employees and encouraging them to be ethical, right? All right, personnel retention. I think loyalty is the number one way to keep employees, right? Making them loyal, making them say, oh, I can't leave this company. You know, this company 
it's done X, Y, Z for me, or I've grown so much here, or leadership is great here. Whatever it may be, we have to get them to be loyal if we want to keep them. How do we make them loyal? Honesty. Whether it's good or bad, employees appreciate honesty. I've, I've been honesty. in situations where I won't say that the organization was dishonest, but they weren't forthcoming when they clearly could have been. And I think it would have helped the employee morale a lot more had they just been upfront about things that were going on rather than not saying anything at all. Because in some, some instances, employees see that just as bad as lying when you're not upfront. You know, that can affect loyalty too. You want to be perceived as a supporter. You don't want to uh, you know, appear as somebody that's against your employees. Uh, you want to make it seem as though you support them, you're an advocate for them, facilitator. Um, you want to be consistent. You don't want to, you know, we just talked about treating certain employees this way and not treating the other ones that way. That's a terrible way to build loyalty. And show that every employee is important. Let them know that you value them, you value their work. Making superiors look good. You think about that one. You, you hear employees always saying, the management, when there's something bad going on. So to combat that, you have to make superiors look good. So if you know your president or your CEO or your manager does something good, Localize that to your department so that they know that they, they do provide good things to the company and to the employees so that they don't just see them as the management. Why do we have turnover? Give me some reasons. Dissatisfaction of the job. Dissatisfaction, what else? Personal problems. Personal, personal reasons. Personal reasons, all right. Money. Money. Yeah. Not getting paid enough. No. Yeah. Better opportunities. I'm sorry? Better opportunities. Better opportunities all together, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they find that one of the main reasons why people leave is because they don't like treatment from the managers. Yeah, they do get that complex. Some right? Of don't like treatment from your immediate supervisor or your immediate manager, whoever that may be. That's a person you're working with every day, you're seeing them every day. So if you don't like them, you're not going to want to stick around, right? Wow. How do we determine if a retention problem really does exist? Well, there's certain reports that you can run. You can look at the rates of turnover. Um, we calculated this in another class last semester. But there's uh, data that you can collect so that you're not just going off of guesses or estimates or assumptions to actually see what your turnover rate is. Another good way is to do exit interviews, which a lot of employees don't really like to do. Um, but an exit interview is basically um, if they leave or as they leave, you have a short survey for them just asking questions as basically why they left. Mm -hmm. And some, they're not required to do it, but um, we like to encourage employees to do it so that we can figure out what's the reason they're leaving. Focus groups. Um, you can also do surveys with the employees that are still working there. I know companies that do kind of an annual survey for their employees to get an idea about their satisfaction, what their opinion is of the company, and how they feel the company is doing. So I think that's another another good way to uh, kind of correct some things if you find that people are unhappy. We already talked about causes. So what are some other ways we can keep people, right? Cash, people like money, yeah. right? So cash-oriented compensation plans. Career development offerings, maybe we offer, you know, tuition reimbursement or, you know, we'll offer you one class, you know, per quarter, or, you know, for you to take. What about health promotion initiatives? Everybody needs some, uh some companies are starting to do like discounted gym memberships and stuff like that. I've even seen companies do daycare. 
It started to do daycare for employees. And I think that a lot of employees like that also as a, some type of incentive to keep them there. Um, I've also seen one company that kind of started a concierge service. So if you had errands to run, certain errands, not all your errands, but if you, if you needed certain errands to be run, they had a concierge service that would take it, like you needed to take your car to get serviced or washed or dry cleaners, errands like that, then they would provide um, those services for you, either free or for a discounted price, depending <coughs> on what the service was. And those were all retention incentives to try to keep people there. So how do we influence retention? Well, it should obviously start in training or new employee orientation. You should already be emphasizing it right there. As soon as they step foot into the organization, don't wait until they've been there five years before you try to talk about retention. Get them as soon as they come in. Coaching, coaching is important. If, um, if someone joins the organization, I think you should immediately um, match them up with a mentor or a coach so I really do think that helps a lot with retention. If they see that someone is really vested in their development and their growth, I think that helps to keep people there as well. Team building, um, I think is good because it kind of promotes teamwork, people working together, interpersonal relationships, getting to know each other. If you feel accepted and liked and you have friends at work, you're probably a little bit more likely to stay than if you go to work and you don't know anybody and, or no one likes you or you can't make any friends. Um, it definitely helps. So morale. How does morale relate to retention? Well, we know that obviously when there's low morale, people leave, right? High morale, people stay. So this may require changing your management style a little bit, right? If you've been a controlling manager, you may need to change to something more like a coach, coaching style, right? Or a more of an encouraging, supportive type of leadership style, rather than just do X, Y, Z, you know, barking out commands. And um, I don't want to say nurturing, but managing in a way that you are challenging your employees, but also still encouraging them at the same time. Another way is to look at it to way how you want to be treated. Like right. If you were working on the floor, would you want somebody to talk to you the way that I'm talking to you? You know, look at it that way. You have to treat people how you want to be treated. You want them to stay. You got to treat them good. I mean, you can't treat them like crap and then expect them to want to stay. Very true. Very true. And I think one thing that happens sometimes is managers forget that they're working with adults and other professionals. And just because you're managing them, doesn't mean that you should not still treat them like an adult and like a professional as you are. So we have to remember to do that as well and obviously provide a safe and comfortable workplace. Uh, we talked about flex schedules a little bit before. Um, as much as you can, try to provide flexible work schedules. Those types of things help with morale as well. Last chapter, complaints, grievances, and appeals. So what's a complaint? Anybody filed a complaint before? No? Well, obviously it's not a good thing. <laughs> no, right? Usually when someone's filing a complaint, something's wrong. Something has gone wrong, something's wrong, somebody's unhappy, they're dissatisfied, something needs attention. So how do, what, what's our role in this? As supervisor, we obviously can't just, you know, let it go by the wayside, we have to bring attention to it, right? Regardless of how ridiculous it may be. Because some people are gonna file complaints and you're gonna read it and you're gonna say, are you serious? You took the time to write this out. I mean, I, I think it's important to understand that every complaint may not be legit, but you have to treat it as such, right? So that means responding effectively and promptly, right? If it's a ridiculous complaint, you can't say I'll get to it next week. As much as you may want to, right? Can a manager or supervisor can go on your computer and read your emails? As an employee, you mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, they have access to. Okay. You're asking for personal reasons. 
No, no, no. Oh, I, I, when I used to work, I had a manager. She used to do that. Just go to my email, whatever, and go to my account and do all kind of stuff. Like that. I don't know necessarily if I agree that that's ethical, but can they do it? Sure. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is they may have um, access, like your password, or they could just go to information systems or whatever. <coughs> but I would think that in order for them to do that, they would have had to. They need to show proof that they had a reason to do it. You know what I mean? Like they suspected something, and they probably need to have that documented. I mean, I mean, so that it's not like an invasion of privacy or something like that. In the However, way. you have to remember when you're at work, that's property of the organization. Yeah, the mm -hmm. yeah. And no personal. Right. What she did was we had another person who works in Virginia, and she also speaks Spanish. So we just you know email you know in Spanish. So she went and translated whatever we were saying, but we wasn't talking anything about Sometimes we just talk about work or sometimes like I was asking personal stuff and I saw that she went and translated and I thought it wasn't right. How did you find out? Because I looked at history. <laughs> I went on history and then I saw like Google Translate and all that stuff. <laughs> That's how I So you play detective. Yeah, I mean, I'm not <laughs> dumb. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I know who to call next time. I need some issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, naive listening. It's basically nothing more than just, you know, when somebody files a complaint, like I said, you want to treat every complaint as it's important. That's also going to require that you listen and you just don't totally dismiss whatever they're filing a complaint about. Right? That smile and nod stage, right? Smile and nod. So these are the three things you want to do. You want to listen, investigate, and if necessary, try to decide what action you're going to take. So you need to inform the employee about whatever you find and what you're going to do. What that means is, you know, John Doe, I've read your complaint. You know, I'm either going to look into it or I've already looked into it and this is what I'm going to do. Whether that be I'm going to forward this to my manager or Whatever the case may be, you want to make sure that they know that you've looked into it and that, you know, moving forward, what's the next step? You want to let them know whatever those are. <clears throat> um, whatever you decide to do, obviously do it. Implement your decision. Follow up on that. If it is, um, I don't know, whatever the complaint, if the complaint is that, you know, I don't know, the break room is smoky, I don't know, you want to fix that and then after you fix it, follow up with them again and say, you know, we've fixed the issue. I'm letting you know that we fixed the issue. That way everything's documented and um, you're covered. Salary controversies. It happens. Well, so-and-so is being paid more than I am. I've been here longer than them or I do more work than them or whatever it may be. Don't make unrealistic promises, especially not with salary because people are very sensitive about salary, right? Don't make, I say don't make any promises. Mm -hmm. um, know the market. Know what everybody else is paying. If you're you know, grossly underpaying your employees and you don't know about it, that's not good. You always want to have a good pulse on what other hospitals or other organizations are paying to make sure you're being competitive in the market. If you have a performer that consistently performs above average, again, as manager, it's your job to be their advocate. So you should be trying to fight for them to get better pay, right? Because you want to keep them. So I'll go back to retention. If, if they're not getting what they're earning or what they deserve as manager, that's when you need to step up, try to help them get there. Last, let employees blow off steam about pay. They're going to complain, right? Don't get paid enough, need a raise, Listen, even if, you, even if, you know, whatever they're complaining about, they shouldn't be complaining about, still try to be as empathetic as possible. Listen to them. Do not discuss salaries with other employees. I don't know why this is even up here. This should be a no-brainer. You should never discuss with anybody getting paid with anybody else. They do that themselves. Well, yeah. I don't <laughs> they know do they do that themselves. Yeah. That's a big no-no. Personal yeah. information. Yeah, it's yeah, like, girl, what you know. get paid? Oh, I'll get this much. Oh, man, what? Yeah, um, 
<laughs> and it's important to know exactly how salary increases are determined. It should be something that is not ambiguous. Although it is in some organizations, it should not be. It should be um, clear cut as to how people receive or when they receive raises. And as a manager, that's something you need to know. So if, if your organization doesn't give raises before you've been there two years, that's something you should know. And that's something you should verbalize so that you don't get people complaining about salary or wondering why they haven't gotten a raise, right? All right, we'll stop here. You know that I don't ask other people, one, I don't like to ask because I don't want to get upset if they get paid more than me. And I just keep Or mind. you don't want them to get upset at you yeah, if you get paid more than them. And I just keep my mind. I just need to get um, experience. I need experience. I need experience. And that's why it keep me going. <laughs> yep. So, whatever. All right. Have a good day. <laughs>